Hi, this is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. In video G on the blood vessels, we're going to start focusing on the various factors that impact blood pressure. There are quite a few factors that impact blood pressure and also blood flow. Recall the formula for blood pressure, that is systemic blood pressure, in which case we can replace the F for flow with cardiac output. And don't forget that flow is going to be uh, the uh, pressure gradient divided by peripheral resistance. All of these formulas are really important for you to remember, plus the formulas that we have learned before in the heart, formulas related to cardiac output, and stroke volume in particular. Because blood pressure is a product of cardiac output, uh, we're going to revisit the, um, the things that regulate cardiac output very briefly because we have studied this before. And we're going to discuss in this particular video the importance of blood volume and how that affects blood pressure. In other videos, we'll take a look at the impact of peripheral resistance on blood pressure, a really important factor. Now in healthy individuals, we're always going to see that if there is any change in one variable, so let's say, let's say that there is a change in cardiac output or in stroke volume, which is part of cardiac output, then we're going to see that somehow our body is going to um, return blood pressure to homeostatic conditions by perhaps adjusting peripheral resistance. Do you see how this works? Let's say that cardiac output is going up, we then will see that uh, peripheral resistance will go down. Or if um, we see peripheral resistance going up, we might see a decrease in cardiac output, again in an attempt to maintain homeostatic levels for blood pressure. Unless we really want blood pressure to go up, for instance, in the case of um, exercising. Now for all of this, um, for, these, for blood pressure to be regulated appropriately, we're going to require, of course, help from the heart itself and the blood vessels themselves, but even the kidneys. So we're going to ultimately bring in the kidneys. We'll introduce them here in the blood vessel chapter, but we're really, really going to explain in quite a bit of detail the importance of kidneys in blood pressure regulation. This is one of the reasons for why when people are having issues with their kidneys, let's say they have cystic kidneys, they typically suffer from hypertension. And of course, all of this also requires supervision from the brain. So remember from our discussion of the heart that cardiac output is a product of stroke volume and heart rate. And we can then tease apart stroke volume, which is the difference between end diastolic and end systolic volume, and add that in our definition of cardiac output. And then finally, remember that blood pressure is the product of cardiac output and peripheral resistance. You can then replace cardiac output with this formula to where your formula for blood pressure ends up looking like this. So blood pressure is therefore going to be EDV minus ESV, which is of course your stroke volume, times, and I'm running out of space here, heart rate, and then also peripheral resistance. So this is your detailed formula for blood pressure, which you really should memorize. Now I'm not going to go over this whole flow chart again, if you need to have hear a detailed discussion, please go back to the videos on the heart. But um, here we then can nicely see the impact that cardiac output can have on blood pressure via heart rate, via stroke volume, in turn via in, in diastolic and systolic volume, and your preload contractility and afterload impacting stroke volume. Um, in addition to hormones, especially impacting heart rate, along with the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So this was just a quick, short review. Go back to the heart videos if you need more help with this flowchart.
in the heart videos. I also introduced you to the two cardiac centers, your cardio accelerator center, which communicates with the sympathetic fibers that uh, affect heart rate and contractility. When they are activated, they will increase heart rate and contractility. The cardio inhibitory center, also located in the medulla, right about here, um, is going to eventually give rise to parasympathetic fibers, which travel through the vagus nerves when they are activated. They're going to keep our heart rate lower. And at rest, it is the parasympathetic fibers that are activated, maintaining what we call vagal tone. So let's, so let's take a look at a picture here of mostly the, the brain stem right about here. Uh, with the medulla that leads into the spinal cord where we find the two cardiac centers. Eventually we will see that these cardiac centers receive information from um, afferent fibers or sensory fibers. So these fibers here, let me color them, these fibers here, they send information into the heart. All right. So information enters the heart into the medulla towards the cardiac centers and inform the cardiac centers of what's going on with the vessels and even the heart. And so then there are two centers, cardio acceleratory and cardio inhibitory center. Remember the cardio inhibitory center, which gives rise to parasympathetic fibers. Uh, those fibers are always going to be part of the vagus nerve as we see right here. And parasympathetic fibers leave the heart directly, so they do not need to use the spinal cord in this situation. Uh, we do remember always have two motor neurons in a row, and ultimately these parasympathetic fibers are going to release acetylcholine onto the heart, and they are going to especially regulate the sinoatrial node. Now, our sympathetic fibers um, are not going to arise from the cardiac center or cardio acceleratory center directly. So from the cardio acceleratory center, we're going to see an interneuron that descends down into the spinal cord. And now we're going to see arising from the spinal cord our two consecutive motor neurons. So here is our first preganglionic sympathetic neuron and then the postganglionic post one that is then going to innervate um, the, the different regions in the heart. These fibers are going to release norepinephrine onto the heart. And again, again, they're going to impact both heart rate and contractility. When they release norepinephrine, they will increase heart rate and contractility. When these fibers are inhibited and nor, no norepinephrine is released, they are going to um, decrease heart rate and decrease contractility. So this wraps up the discussion of the impact of cardiac output on blood pressure via stroke volume, via heart rate, and via the two cardiac centers that are so, so important. And we will keep coming back to these cardiac centers. I think it's probably pretty logical to you that if we have a higher amount of blood in a particular area of the body, that is also going to create more blood pressure. So there's a direct relationship between blood volume and blood pressure. Now, people can suffer from low amounts of blood volume. We refer to that as hypovolemia. You guys know by now that hypo refers to low, vol to volume, and then emia, blood. And the opposite of that would be hypervolemia. Uh, what can cause hypovolemia? Easy. We could be bleeding out, for instance or severe dehydration. Hypervolemia could be excessive drinking, excessive water drinking could perhaps lead to hypervolemia and many other reasons. More on that in your pathophysiology courses. In the next video, we will look at more factors that affect blood pressure.